Gina, thank you so much for joining me on College Hood Advice. I'm so happy to have you here. I'm happy to be here. Thank you. And thank you as well. So this episode is called Navigating College with Anxiety and Depression, which both you and I and our broad experience working with students know can be one of the biggest challenges that students are facing and navigating while pursuing the college experience. And so I like to start by defining terms that we're utilizing to make sure that we're all starting from an equal playing field with understanding, because sometimes there's a lot of misconceptions and misinformation around some of these terms. So first, I'd like to start by defining anxiety and its common symptoms, and then we'll move to depression and its common symptoms. Sure. Well, anxiety, as we know, is a normal, healthy emotion, right? We all feel some anxiety at some point in our life, especially then we have a transition, which is starting college. So it's normal to feel a little bit of apprehension. Sometimes we will know that we'll miss our family and it's all new. The difference between feeling a little bit of anxiety and having a full-blown anxiety disorder is that those feelings will persist for two, three, four weeks. And then that feeling of anxiety becomes completely overwhelming. And at times the anxiety is out of proportion with what the trigger actually is, right? So these feelings take on physical symptoms. It can be upset stomach. I hear kids with stomach problems, they can't eat or maybe they're um, extremely worried, restless, not able to sleep or sleeping too much. And what comes down to it is that the concentration in school that they once had is lessening and lessening. So that's what we're starting to see with anxiety. And to a point when it gets severe that kids start to procrastinate on their schoolwork. And so it's interfering with their daily life. Mm -hmm. And what, Let's, as a contrast, or to add on, maybe not as a contrast, what is depression and, and what are some common symptoms of depression? So the difference with depression is that things that we enjoy doing formally, when we get depressed, we just don't feel like doing. You know, we may have outlets that we enjoy. It could be, you know, a hobby, a sport, running, whatever it is. We don't want to do those things anymore. Usually you see a change in appetite and kids have trouble sleeping or they're sleeping too much. And even when they are getting up and functioning through the depression, they feel fatigued. They feel a loss of energy. Um, the depression is just weighing down on them. So they're moving slower through their day and their activities. So schoolwork gets harder and concentrating becomes very difficult and making decisions become pretty difficult. And what is the, and anxiety can be a symptom of depression. Am I, yes. am I correct in that? Correct. And what, what is depression's definition? Because I know sometimes, I ask that because sometimes people um, think they're sad and they may say I'm depressed or they, maybe they're, they are truly depressed, but people are sort of blowing it off or minimizing it. And so I want to make sure that we define the term just to help students who may be experiencing it, recognize it, or others who may be observing someone uh, may also have a better sense of recognizing it. So uh, again, the depression is more than just, I feel down, you know, that kind of thing. Um, it's not like we should be saying, well, you're an introvert or you don't have a lot of friends and you're kind of quiet into yourself. So it's natural that, you know, you're, you're depressed, you know, you're, you know, in our mind, what a depressed person is, um, or that, well, you tend to be, your personality is a little negative anyway, right? You see the glass half empty. So it's natural that, you know, Johnny is, you know, always, we see him as a depressed person. He's always been that way. Um, that's not the case at all because with depression, we will see those symptoms. Those symptoms do persist and it is something that's a medical illness, just like any other illness, and it needs to be treated. And so when we say treatment, then we start to look at things like diagnosis, medication, and therapy. And I think we're starting to hint at this a little bit, but I'd like to deepen. What are some common misconceptions that you see in your work around our understanding of anxiety and depression? I think sometimes parents will say to me, well, Susie just needs to mature, 
and I think this is going to go away. She's going to be 18 in two months, and I think she's going to start to feel better. Or um, this is just because she stopped playing such and such sport, and she hurt her leg. And so I think things are going to be better when she finishes her physical therapy in two months. Um, something like that, usually. That's what you're, you'll be hearing, and we don't need to treat this. And I went through this when I was younger. So a mood, sometimes just yeah. a moodiness, natural, a funk, a phase. Yes, it's a phase they're going through. Absolutely, yes. And in that same line of questioning, what are some mistakes that you see once a student is diagnosed and living with depression and anxiety? What are some mistakes that you see students making um, as they are, you know, living in their, when it comes to living with anxiety and depression? Lots of mistakes. <laughs> um, and I think those mistakes, I mean, it could be, you know, you are 17 or 18 when you start college, but if the depression is new to you, you don't usually know how to handle it, right? Mm -hmm. Imagine if you never had a cold before, you wouldn't, you really wouldn't know how to handle that. So the depression could be pretty new to a lot of students that are on campus. And I think they don't know how to manage it. They forget that it is something that they need to treat and need to pay attention to, that it's not going to go away on its own. So things you'll see kids doing might be not getting enough sleep. I mean, a couple hours, three or four hours, um, maybe overeating, maybe if they are on medication, not taking their medication as prescribed. And I had one student that I do academic coaching with and I Skype in with her while she's at school. And we took a look at her week and she said, well, I do have these meds that I'm going to take, but I have an early morning class. And so it's hard to take them. And I said, well, if you haven't been taking them, I can understand that you're not feeling well that, and you're expecting yourself to feel better just with time, but you take them later in the day and you really need to take them two or three times a day. Mm -hmm. So just, you know, not managing it, not taking care of themselves, not exercising, oversleeping and not understanding this is something we need to pay attention to. Yeah, what I'm really hearing you say is that you're really not honoring your wellness and self-care. Right. right. Yeah. I've seen the, uh, the same thing in alignment with meds and my work with students, uh, students who are starting to feel better, um, take coming off the meds themselves, pulling themselves off the meds because they feel better. And then that causing exacerbating um, issues and them not being prepared when stress and challenges in the semester start to mount because they've removed themselves from the medication because they feel better. Well, oftentimes I will see even students that in high school were taking some meds, they go off to college and they tell me, this is a lot to remember. I have to have a piece of toast in the morning at 7.30 and then run off to my class and I know I have a test and I have to study for the test and I know I can probably take those meds later. And eventually what happens is they figure, let me just try this you know, without the meds and see how I'm feeling. The trouble is in the first two weeks, you're probably going to be feeling worse mm -hmm. and not better. So those are the things that I start to see. Do you see too, if parents have had a, a big role in helping manage those things, students having a difficulty taking on those responsibilities? Yes, absolutely. It's all new to them. They're not aware that um, they forget that someone uh, was doing their laundry previously, and now this is something that they need to do on their own. Um, someone was cooking their meals before. There is no one cooking their meals. And um, they may have had a tutor in the past to help with homework. And now they need to find these key people in their life to help them mm -hmm. to do all these things. Yeah. So what are some recommendations you have kind of shifting gears a little bit to, to thrive with anxiety and depression in the college environment? If you had a top three, let's say, things that you would recommend students have in place and habits that they are practicing to help them thrive, what would they be? Well, when I have students that have anxiety, depression, and they're taking meds, before they get to school, I would say, 
you need to find a pharmacy either on campus or close to campus that's going to accept your insurance where you'll be able to get your medication refills because it's unlikely that this is gonna work out with mom and dad mailing it to you, even if, it, even if it's successful one time. You need to be able to handle that on your own. And then the second piece of advice would be to visit the college, to, the, to visit the uh, counseling center where there are psychologists on staff to see if they'll take your insurance and find out how many sessions they'll approve. They may only see students for four or five times. And if you've been in therapy for a year or more, you need a private therapist, probably mm -hmm. off campus, hopefully a few blocks from campus. So those are the two okay. things I think you need to have on board before you arrive on campus. And then the last thing I would say is that if you have accommodations in your own high school and your teachers are aware of this, you have some anxiety, depression, sometimes you may get some extra time on some assignments. This is something that you need to address um, at least over the summer, a month before you arrive on campus. Yeah, Gina can see me and I'm shaking my head emphatically to all of those things because what I, what I see happen in my long tenure working at universities is that the, the students who do that, who take that, that advice, you know, they are, they hit the ground with a strong foundation yeah. and when they're something successful. pops up, they're successful. It's not the students who, who have these conditions and these experiences can be so wildly successful. I've seen some of the most successful students. It's about managing them. And this is a huge, huge, this, these three steps are a huge part of successfully managing them once you're in the college environment. Yes, and when I Skype in with students, when we talk, I might say, so what was going well in high school, you know, the last semester? Well, I was taking my meds. I was getting that power bar in the morning. You know, we have a checklist. And did you take your meds regularly? Yes. Well, how did you get them? Well, my mom went to the pharmacy. Okay, that has disappeared. We need to fill in that piece. Yes. And I think I've seen a lot of students who they don't take, they don't heed this advice. And when a crisis emerges, they feel kind of out, out to shore, like out in the sea, out to sea. And it's really difficult to get all these things in place when you are having a moment where you need them most. And so you being proactive and getting them into place, super critical. Yes, I would agree. I also tell students when they go to their orientation in the summer to stop by the different offices at the school. It could be the medical clinic or whatever. They could be a hospital on campus. Find out what's available. And this could be if I, if I get really sick, if I get the flu or if I break my leg or I just need to talk with someone. You know, most people that are on meds, they need to see a psychiatrist at least every six months, sometimes every four months. So who is that person going to be? And can the school provide that service for you? That's super important. Yeah, most campuses do provide um, counseling centers, but they're short term. Uh, and if you do need long term providers, getting them off campus is important. And I think a really underutilized resource is the Student Disabilities Office, which is what it's called on most campuses. And that office is going to help students uh, negotiate accommodations that they qualify for based on physical and mental illnesses and also uh, learning differences. And so it's super important to connect with that office. And I see a lot of students connect with that office very late. They don't yes. know. Sometimes too, these things can be diagnosed. Maybe you weren't diagnosed with them before you entered college, but they're diagnosed once you on get campus. to college and the are on campus. Semester, yes. Do you mind talking to that a little bit and what you've sure. seen in your experience? I have seen a number of things happen. Most of the students that I work with in college counseling, I do see them while they're in high school. So we do set up that plan in advance and usually parents are there during the week of orientation or visit in the summer. But sometimes I do get calls from parents um, or siblings, let's say, and they tell me the child has anxiety and they're having a tough time with the disabilities office. So the first thing I say is they're gonna need a letter from a physician. Mm -hmm. um, I had one family tell me, um, I, uh, I gave my child the medication uh, from his brother's medication 
and it worked beautifully. And I said, well, that's great, but they still need to see a physician because that may not be working long-term and that may not be the right meds for them. So there's usually some place on campus that's some kind of a medical facility with physicians. So that's the first thing that they need to do. And then like you say, to find out about the counseling center, to go in person or place a phone call or have a friend maybe go with you and try and get that appointment as soon as possible. Yeah, or even go to your academic advisor or trusted faculty member. I've walked many students to the Health and Counseling Center and helped them um, get connected there because it's such an important resource on a campus. And to your point, if you are experiencing symptoms, do not self-medicate. You want no. to definitely be under the care of a medical professional. Everyone has different reactions to these things. And though it may feel great and work in that moment, it is not a healthy choice long term to do that. Right, right, absolutely. Yeah, and to disability services offices, they need documentation and they need dated official recent documentation directly from your medical providers. And so you can't just say, I'm feeling these things, I need accommodations. Also, they're right. going to determine what accommodations are appropriate and accommodations are not a blank check to have all the flexibility in the world. You are still responsible for the material of a class and mastery of the course. They are just a way to level the playing field. They also aren't making the course easier for you. They are leveling the playing field. So I have students, and I don't know if you have this experience, I'd love to hear yeah. it, who feel guilty and feel bad about- Using their accommodations. Using their accommodations. And it makes me nuts. I'm gonna tell you, I'm just gonna be honest. It makes me crazy. Use your accommodations. Yes. Yeah, I do work with students that have learning issues in ADD, and in that case, they do need a licensed educational psychologist mm -hmm. to complete a testing report, and uh, these are the, the students that may call me, and they may have anxiety, depression, along with ADD, and um, with the anxiety and depression, usually if they're meeting with a physician, they can write a note, they can do the testing. It's not as in-depth as if you would have a learning disability, but yes, you do need to be proactive. And oftentimes students may say, I have my um, disabilities uh, information here in front of me. I have the report. What do I do now? Mm -hmm. And there's usually paperwork online on the website that you would need to download, complete, and sometimes you can upload it right through that portal. Um, so there is information there for you, but you need to seek it out. You need to go either in person or you need to read through the website and find out what are the steps in place that I need in order to get my accommodations? Yeah, and every campus across the United States has these offices and these systems for you. Yes. So we've covered a lot of ground. Before we sign off, a couple of things. One, are there any resources that you recommend? And two, I'd love for you to speak to anything else that you can think of that I'm not thinking of that we might have missed. Well, the one thing I would say is if you have a friend that you think is really depressed, it's important to pay attention to those things. Be a friend, maybe sit down in a quiet place, ask them how they're doing. And if you think they're really at a hopeless point, maybe you will walk over to the counseling center with them, wait, wait in the waiting room there, really be a friend for them. And if you think that it's really serious, there is a national suicide prevention, you know, hotline that you can call just to get information and that you can pass this information along to the student who needs it because there is help out there. Yes, and many campuses have suicide prevention training that you can take part of in the student disability services or through student life on many campuses as well um, because it's very serious and if you do have a friend who mentions it, don't dismiss it. Let someone know help them get help. Yes, these are things that we need to take serious. Mm -hmm. um, any other, anything else you can think of before we sign off? You know, I just think it's important to um, be a friend, whether your friend, you know, has ADD or is on meds, that we need to know that this is something pretty common. Um, more and more students have anxiety, depression, and like you say, if they put a plan in place, they can be extremely successful um, if they care for themselves um, and follow a plan. And that plan will take them from college into their career. 
So it's a great place to learn about yourself while you're in college and how to manage. And if you are interested in addition to this one on anxiety and depression, learning more about navigating college with ADD and other executive functioning differences, we do have an episode also on that with Lynn Minor Rosen that I will link to in the show notes. And again, if you will also link to the resources that Gina has mentioned, and so you can access those there. Gina, how can listeners connect with you? Um, probably through my email, college prep by Gina at Gmail. Great. Thank you so much for coming on the show today to speak about this really important and I know much needed topic. It's been a big request. So thanks so much for coming on. Thanks for having me, Katie.